I think we can start now, Emma. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so hello and welcome everyone to the Be Waste Twice webinar of the month. And I'm Akanksha Singh, I'm the community uh, builder at Be Waste Twice. Uh, before we begin, I would like to give a brief introduction on the Be Waste Wise uh, organization. It is a nonprofit organization to grow around the principles of dialogue and diversity, addressing the need for knowledge dissemination on waste management since uh, 2013. We started off with one moderator, and now we have more than 12 uh, till last year who are among the best at what they do and come from different parts of the world and society. They are uh, posing questions and teasing out insights and guiding conversations like how Emma is doing in this webinar, uh, which are more relevant to us than those in other online and offline uh, places. Uh, we have more than 300 uh, contributors uh, as well who have taken part in this journey. Emma is one such eminent and learned moderator we have with us, and she is the founder of Lighthouse Sustainability. For more than 25 years, uh, she's been working with businesses around the globe to work on sustainability and also to help with even startups and even businesses to find a pragmatic solid pathway through sustainability circularity supporting uh, conventional industries you know disrupt conventional industries and deliver bespoke training emma has been moderating be waste wise webinars for more than years uh, more than many years now and uh, she's going to talk to two very uh, you know, renowned uh, experts today in this uh, webinar, uh, Andrew Mullen from Beko PLC and Margot Reynolds from the University of Exeter. In today's uh, webinar discussion, we are focusing on the future of circularity in electrical appliances, and we will focus on the perspective of recycling, life cycle analysis in the design process, challenges for e-waste, repair and recycling, and also to understand some barriers for change in the transition to a circular economy in this industry. Uh, before we proceed further to the discussion, we would request you all to know that this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded later uh, on our uh, website and on our uh, YouTube channel. We request all the attendees to use the Q&A function for any questions to the panel, which would we would encourage everybody to pose as many questions as you can to the panel and to the moderator. And we would request you all to please use the chat function to introduce yourself from where you're joining, which organization. And if you have any comments or any discussion pointers for the moderator to, dis to, dis to discuss, so then you can please post that in the chat function as well. So back to the ta topic and to the eminent panel, over to you, Emma. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here again, and I love moderating these uh, these webinars. As you can see, we've got about 60 people joining us uh, here today already. I'm sure that will continue to, to go up. And thank you to everyone who's put their details in the chat. If you want to share your LinkedIn profiles, go ahead as well. It's a great way to connect. We already know that we share an interest in this topic, uh, the future of circularity in, uh, in electro electrical items, electrical um, appliances. And I'm going to waste no time in introducing my brilliant panel here. I've got Margot Reynolds um, and Andrew Mullen. Um, Margot, would you like to go ahead and just quickly introduce yourself? Sure, great. So um, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Um, my name is Margot Reynolds. I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Exeter, um, and I'm working within the UKRI's uh, NICER program, which is a lovely acronym for the National Interdisciplinary Circular Economy Research program, um, if you can say that one quickly. Um, and my research um, more broadly looks at determining how we can effectively disseminate and govern metrics for businesses transitioning to circular business models. Um, and in the context of this webinar and what we're talking about today, I also um, worked on a, a report that's just recently been put out where we looked at um, the role of education um, in enabling resource efficient behaviors um, and product life extension behaviors from consumers. So that's sort of my relevance to what we're talking about today. Uh, and you can probably tell from the accent, I am um, not from, I am work, working in the UK now, but I'm from Australia and I've seen in the chat, there's a couple of people from um, back home. So yeah, welcome. great. I recently met Karen, uh, who's here from Mendit Aussie. Uh, literally this week so again these webinars are great for pe pulling pe people together as well as just you know learning from each other thank you margo maybe if you get time could you drop a, a link to the nicer um network as well because it is a bit of a mouthful at least people be able to see uh what's going on there that would be great andrew could you give us a couple of uh words please to introduce yourself 
Sure. So hello, everybody. My name is Andrew Mullen. Um, I am a, a sustainability and regulatory affairs specialist. I'm based um, within Beco PLC, but actually work with the wider group, our parent company, Archilic. So primarily focused on the UK, um, but more widely across the world as well. Um, I've been in the industry, consumer electronics and domestic appliances for, for over 35 years now. Um, I've been involved particularly in we and waste um, uh, for over 20 years um, on behalf of the company. Uh, and I'm a non-executive director of a WE compliance scheme in the UK. Um, and, and I also look after areas like um, uh, regulations on eco-design, sustainability, eco-modulation, uh, and get involved with various stakeholders who also have an interest in it. Fantastic. Thank you, Andrew. Um, when I brought Margot and Andrew together for this panel, um, I wanted to try and cover off lots of different bases. Uh, so Andrew coming from a manufacturing point of view and also a regulatory point of view, so thank you for that. Um, and anyone not familiar with WE, that's the Waste Electrical Electronic Equipment. Um, Very good. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, let's, we'll try and explain any acronyms as we go, but um, WE being the first one. And then I also wanted to bring Margot in to give us a view from both the academic side, but also the sort of more consumer angle in terms of um, perceptions and, um, you know, what, what the research is showing us. Um, and the reason I did that is because I see a bit of a gap between what people might think should happen around repair, reuse, re recycling, um, and what is actually happening and what manufacturers think should happen. Um, so I'm kind of keen to bring people together and uh, thank you to Be Wastewise for hosting this platform to try and unpick some of those kind of knotty problems. So as I said to some of you in, on LinkedIn coming along today, please use the Q&A to ask those questions you've always wanted to ask of a manufacturer. We might be able to clear up some of those kind of misconceptions today, but also to, um, to help us think about a way forward. You know, this is about the panel hearing what your view is as well. And I can see brilliantly lots of you are from the repair sector, from the reuse sector. So we're not gonna solve these challenges without collaborating. So let's form some of those networks as we go as well today. I'm going to kick us all off, though, and thank you to everyone who's just joining us. Um, Akanksha, could you pop the first poll up, please? So I'm going to pop a little poll up here. It's anonymous for you just to tell us what you think. Do you believe the electrical appliance sector is taking circularity seriously? Circularity is quite a broad term. So remembering that that encompasses everything from um, leasing models, sharing models, through to reuse, all the way down to recycling. Okay. So we've got about 44 responses so far. And uh, yeah, leaning into my last point there, yes, but needs more effort and collaboration. Okay, so some of you are seeing lots of action. But a larger proportion, nearly 20%, are not seeing any action at all. Okay, just give a chance for everybody else to pop into that poll. Fabulous. Anybody else want a second to pop into the poll? 84% of you have actually quite a broad split there. So we're seeing a small number of people saying, yes, definitely seeing some action. Uh, yes, but needs more effort. Nearly 50% of you saying that, oh, that wouldn't surprise me. We certainly haven't come close to solving this problem, but perhaps a worrying amount of people, nearly uh, over 50% actually saying, no, we need more education. And no, I'm not seeing any action in this area. So maybe I might start there. Um, are we doing enough? You know, are we talking about enough about this topic? Or actually, are we doing enough about this topic? Margot, could you start us off with a kind of perspective from your work? 
So, uh, so as you said, I'm, I'm sort of, I guess, coming from a bit more of an academic perspective, first of all. So the work that I've done in this space was looking more at the consumer side. Um, yeah. A big thing about the, uh, you know, within the electric, electric you know, um, sector is that, and particularly with um, uh, appliances, is that a lot of the emissions and, and sort of other negative um, impacts of, of the industry comes from the use stage. And so um, that those sort of recent findings from some of the academic and literature has been finding that something between like 73 and 93%, I understand that's still quite a large breadth, but it's much more than 50% is within the use phase. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to um, put some action into how we can best um, work with the consumers. So make sure that they have more active role uh -huh. alongside manufacturers. So um, when we, so the point of our research was to say what's what's lacking there, why are we seeing that this is the largest impact space and how can we reduce that? Do, people, do consumers feel, um, you know, educated on the, you know, firstly, the energy efficiency uh, opportunities with their appliances and then in the product life extension so things like maintenance and repair and ultimately across the board particularly in regard to maintenance and repair before we had any sort of interventions with our study the, uh, the overall sort of consensus um, is that people either don't feel um, aren't educated on how to best use their appliances um, don't feel confident in their abilities don't have the right sort of um, uh, resources or um, opportunity to um, perform beha repair behaviors and such. So I think it's a really interesting space where the work that we've done is basically highlighted that there is opportunity for education to play a big role. And I know that I'm always speaking about one sort of finite space there about education as being um, one part because that obviously has to go hand in hand with the um, you know manufacturer design um, and also end of end of end of life. So um, mm. the full value chain of, of these products mm, great okay so you're definitely seeing a gap then between perhaps um the amount of repair and reuse that could take place and some of the barriers um, around that so um just to come on to to you andrew do you think we're doing enough sort of how how uh, you know how how much of a priority is this in in the sector um i think attitudes are changing within the sector certainly um you know I, I mentioned before that i started in the industry 35 years ago um i started my career working for sony when sony was one of the the, the big brands uh in the uk and consumer electronics uh, after i when i joined um cd players had only been out maybe um you know four or five years ironic now that that's now an obsolete technology effectively but they've been out four or five years um and the first cd players were were about a thousand pounds and people were interested in getting them repaired so at the point at which i joined in 87 the current model of cd player at that point was 200 pounds um and so probably the the desire to repair had, had already started to decline um much of my early career was actually spent on the after sales side and there was a thriving after sales business and repair business within the UK, not necessarily through our own manufacturer, our own service, but through an independent network. There's a really strong independent network of, of service engineers. But I think what we've seen is as product prices have dropped, clearly the, the option of replacement rather than repair has become far more attractive. Um, and, and I think it's probably fair to say that what we need to do as manufacturers is help consumers with the choice, because although it's become less attractive. It doesn't mean it's not an opportunity. I think as manufacturers, we're we're very, very good at telling people about how energy efficient new products are. We're less good at helping them make an informed choice. And that informed choice is around, should I have my product? Should I replace my product? Is it a point now where it's served its useful life and I should have it responsibly recycled? Is it a point where I should get it repaired? Um, uh, or is it a point where, where perhaps I consider secondhand? So um, there's plenty we can do, I think, to, to to help people make that informed choice. I think part of that is engaging with um, some of the other stakeholders that are involved. Uh, and I noticed there's some of them on the call. Um, and I think we're, we're trying to do that. We are genuinely trying to do that. But we need them to engage with us as well. It can't be a one way street. We need engagement from both sides. And there needs to be a proper, sensible conversation around if we're going to help keep products in the market for longer, if we're going to keep products repaired, how do we ensure that that's done safely, 
first and foremost, so the consumer is safe, but also how do we do it so that if it is repaired, it doesn't go wrong again in three months time and the consumer's not really benefited from that. Brilliant, great. And so much there already starting to come through. Um, thank you for you know giving us that context around cost because we are in a very different um, you know, consumer marketplace and very fast moving as well. Um, and one of the things I wanted us to focus on today is that collaboration piece. I sort of get the idea that the, there are players out there, but that we've never been able to galvanize uh, you know, anything to any degree, which is why I guess we're waiting, often waiting for regulation to come in place. But do we have time is another bigger question. Um, what's you know what's what's coming through here is why does repair feel so difficult for consumers andrew what are your thoughts what sort of feedback are you getting from people i i think the reason it feels difficult for consumers is firstly where do you go where do you go for a repair and a lot of people obviously i'm going to think wrongly but nevertheless i have to accept that the fact exists a lot of people are, are wary of going to the manufacturer because they believe that they will be expensive but beyond that, I think there is this concern that if you call out an engineer, the engineer will come out to your house and they'll look at your, your washing machine, your fridge, whatever it is. There's a there's a cost to them doing that. You know, that's not that they're they're looking to profiteer. The fact is that, you know, if an engineer comes out to your house, there is a cost. The cost of putting an engineer on your, your doorstep before he's even sort of unpacked his toolbox is quite expensive. Um, and somebody's got to cover that cost. Um, and what people don't want to do is they don't want to pay that and then find that the engineer goes in and says, oh, well, actually, it's going to cost you three or four hundred pounds to repair that. There is, you know, the, I don't think that the engineer network in the UK at the moment necessarily has the best reputation. There are certainly some some less reputable businesses out there who won't use genuine spare parts. They'll use pattern parts. They'll, you know, they'll do the easy work and tell you that the difficult stuff is is just not repairable um and it's just it's just too complicated i think for people so one of the challenges we have as as manufacturers is is to help them and the one way we can really help them i think is by you know giving them you know offering chargeable repairs at a fixed cost up front and saying it doesn't matter what's wrong with your product we will fix it for this amount of money if your product is of an age now where we think it's probably reached the end of its useful life we will tell you um and um you know if we do repair it then we will guarantee it so that you get an additional useful period of life out of it yeah good and i think you touched on something there that's really important you know when is the end of a use the useful life of a piece of equipment margo i'm going to come back to you here because you talked a lot about uh the use phase of a product uh so one of the conversations i get into with, with people is when they say my fridge is 25 years old and they're like yay and i'm and i i'm thinking that sounds like it's going to be terribly inefficient to me you know so there is a point where products um are better to be reused i say better in in, in carbon terms and i think that's very confusing for people um, Andrew, maybe I'll come back to you in a minute in terms of which products they might be. Um, but Margo, what's your what's your take on that? Why is repair feeling so difficult? And and this kind of how do we know when it's a good idea? Yeah. So in the uh, the research that we did, we essentially, as we like to do, like to come up with nice little nice tables that clearly identify some of the barriers. So that we have sort of five types, I guess, of the of the barriers that made it difficult for consumers. So firstly, there's we um, you know, uh Andrew's brought up this the actual you know repair in terms of going back to the manufacturer or to other repair shops and such. But there was also in our conversations a lot of people that are doing attempting DIY or, or that kind of thing and doing it at home. So the first barrier is that sort of practical um capability and not maybe having the access to the right materials or their own skills to personally you know, make any sort to amend or you know repair any of their products, um, let alone maintain them. So, and the convenience of that. Then there's the sort of social aspect of um, the this idea of sort of second second life products. And do you want to be working with something that maybe has a visible crack that's being glued together versus and you know a new um, a new product for the saving of maybe not that much money, for example. 
there's the socioeconomic side, which is much more about also, as Andrew's mentioned there, about actually being the availability of monies to afford this repair. And a lot of the time um, our participants were saying that ultimately they found it was cheaper to just buy something new than to you know, bother repairing something. Um, then there's the systemic thing. So the, the actual barriers there are to barriers to entry for repair businesses or, or maybe avail availability of um, spare parts and such for, like you said, the products that have been, or appliances that people have had for 10, 15 years. Some of these businesses might not even be in business anymore or they might not have the parts available. So that kind of thing, if you're trying to look for longevity in your products, um, and you know, if you're if you're over your warranty, and then that's that's a whole thing for a lot of people. Is why would I bother doing that if I can't get it for a for a decent price? Um, and then finally, psychologically, a really big thing in the circular um, space and, and in conversation is about this idea of emotional durability. So what's our emotional attachment to our products? Like, do people feel invested enough in their appliances? And, you know, personally, I wouldn't say that I'm very invested in my toaster, but then someone else might say that they've had it for 10 years. It's, it's been through five moves, that kind of thing. That can actually play a really big role in someone's willingness to to repair things. So how involved are we with these appliances in the first place to want to have them stick around versus get something new? So wow, uh, right. yeah, a whole lot of different types of it's reasons. It's really and complex, isn't it? And I'm already thinking, well, there's no wonder why this is so difficult, right? And it's really complex. And I'm looking at some of the questions and comments coming through here, which are brilliant. And I know we've just dived into repair, but I, I kind of get the feeling that this is where the naughtiest problems are. We can talk a bit about recycling. Um, if we get time, but it seems to be generating quite a lot of interest. Um, so Karen here saying, and I think Karen's in, in Australia, if I'm right, manufacturers can help us repair by providing manuals, schematics and spare parts, um, as well as manufacturing durable and repairable products. Um, so about having some standards, Andrew, is that something that we need to, to help organisations like, uh, like Karen's do more? I've been looking at the questions and, and clearly they're the questions that I hear quite quite often. And, and, you know, I think you're right. This is where we need the debate. I was, I was going to come back on something Margot said first, though, which is about emotional attachment. Mm. You know, we, wait, we make workhorse appliances. There's no, you know, that's the reality. Nobody is, or very few people are invested in their washing machine or certainly in Western Europe in their fridge freezer. It's slightly different in Southeast Asia where a fridge freezer is a status symbol. It tends to be in the living room rather than the kitchen. But certainly for most of our products, um, it, they're not, you know, they're not things like um, uh, mobile phone where people will mm -hmm. take the time and trouble to learn how it works and how to use it. It's not like the latest games console where people are invested in that. People aren't invested in our products. And, and you know, that is demonstrated not least by the numbers of letters and emails that we get from customers who spell Beko wrong. It's four letters and it's written on the front of their appliance and they sell, they still spell it wrong. That's how little they care about that product until it goes wrong. Um, <laughs> I think in terms of, you know, the comments that have been made, and as I said, they're, they're, they're comments I hear a lot. I think where the concern sits with manufacturers, and this is our concern, Actually, before I go into that, let me say our products are repairable. Our products are designed to be repairable, and they're designed to be repairable because we repair them. Um, we have we we have warranties of varying periods. We have our own fleet of engineers. Every every minute that engineer spends in a customer's house if a product un is under warranty is costing us money. So it's not in our interest to make things difficult to repair. Genuinely isn't. Where our concern exists is, of course, we can make all this information available. And those who are equipped to use that information sensibly and safely would be able to do so. But the fact is, once we've published it and it's out in the, uh, the free market, we've got no control over who reads it. We've got no control over who tries to repair their appliance. And we've got no control over that individual safety but also the safety of whoever owns that appliance um, in terms of electrocution, in terms of fire, in terms of all that aspects of it. And this really is where we need to have the debate mm -hmm. um, because our spare parts are available. Um, um, we will help qualified engineers repair appliances. 
But the problem we see at the moment when it comes to regulation, when you look at the UK uh, and the right to repair regulation, um, it says it gives us uh, an obligation to provide information to um, professional repairers. Now, we've asked government several times, what's a professional repairer? And they've said, well, that's for you to determine. Mm -hmm. And that actually isn't really um, a good situation. And, and the problem is that if we start providing information to people who aren't competent, then we have a liability for that. So, you know, I think the trouble is we're looking for a one size fits all, but we're looking for that one size fits all with our own, within our own individual silos. And what we need to find is a solution that works for those who can do it, but uh, keeps those who can't do it safe. Mm, good. And thank you for, for bringing up that safety angle, because in circularity, we often think about recycling or, or even reuse of, of kind of products that are not safety you know, issues. So maybe clothing or books or you know, whatever. But as soon as we get into electrical items and the focus of today, that is a whole big, you know, area and um, that, that we need to that we need to really focus on. And, and there's plenty of stories, if you Google it, of people who've attempted to repair their own washing machine and died doing it. Um, and that's a tragedy. And it's, it's a tragedy that can be avoided. Yeah. Yeah. Unnecessary. OK. Um, I know there's a couple of people. Hello, Simon uh, from Angle Poise is on the call. who also runs an electrical business, so Angle Poise Lamps. So maybe Simon could come back in the chat and tell us what his thoughts are around repair and safety. Um, I'm just looking down. I'm really keen to dive into the questions because there's some really good ones here. Um, Mo uh, Moray, um, I think we've dealt with your question about availability of parts. Andrew, from what you know, does that vary across the world in different countries? Because I know you say parts are available in the UK. Mm -hmm. Does that vary? Certainly from our business perspective, no. Um, there are, I know there are some businesses that keep a much tighter control over spare parts. Um, I, I, I've certainly had conversations with one of the, the games platforms where they say they do restrict parts, but that's for, well, they say that that's for intellectual property reasons. Now, I'm not I'm not in a position to judge whether or not that's true, but you know I could certainly see it's a possibility. But so no, certainly from our perspective, um, we don't restrict parts. We hold well over two hundred thousand parts here in the UK alone, um, and I think that's the other thing that we 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 never talk about and needs to feed the factor into the debate, mm -hmm. which is. We hold all those parts because if somebody's washing machine goes wrong, they're not going to wait four weeks for us to bring it over from the factory. We've got to have it there and then. Um, what that means is we have a high redundancy of parts. So every year we throw thousands of parts away because they've sat in a warehouse for 10 years. And nobody wants them. Um, now we can and we are very good at, at sort of. Uh, profiling our parts usage so that we minimize that but nevertheless it's going to take place and so mm -hmm. you've got this this contradiction between having the parts on hand for when people need them but also accepting that you're going to throw a lot of them away because with most parts people won't want them yeah yeah great and just coming back to a point here um in the q a it says in india and many developing countries we have an entire sector only working on repair of it and white goods um, so why is it so difficult in developed countries? So, uh, yeah, you've mentioned costs, Andrew, and maybe skills. If you had to maybe tell a government minister, and I know you do have meetings with government regularly, what's the one thing holding us back in, 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 you know, developed nations? We should be able to do this, surely. We should. Look, I think, you know, what holds every, most things back is cost. Um, so I think, you know, for, for a long time, you know, one of the areas where we do have common ground with people like um, uh, repair cafes and, and independent repairers is VAT. You could get rid of VAT on spare parts. Um, you could get rid of VAT on repairs, um, and that would help right. stimulate the market. Because, you know, I think in a situation where realistically, if the cost, the cost of a repair is going to be 150, 170 pounds, on a washing machine, people will go out and buy a new one because they can buy a new one for probably somewhere between 200 and 250 uh, and it will come, it will be brand new uh, and it will come with a warranty and, and it's it's problem solved for the next few years. 
Yeah, definitely. Margot, did you want to come in there? I don't know if you've done any work on cost as a as an influencer or a barrier, but it keeps coming up, doesn't it? So, I mean, so again, as part of our research, we were looking a lot at motivations for consumers and, and whether they would want to perform. Um, and I, I, I say more collectively life extension um, product life extension so that includes maintenance because I think when we if we do put too much emphasis on repair as Andrew said it's it's only when something breaks that we think about repair Good. but there's there's a real opportunity within that use phase for the maintenance to also be an emphasis area for us to be educating consumers on so um because a lot of the, I mean again in the findings a, a lot of the reasons people choose to maintain so that might just be like cleaning things out or um you know correctly stocking your fridge or you know emptying the little tray in your toaster things like that like maintenance behaviors um are mainly just for hygiene reasons or for aesthetic purposes mm -hmm. but they're not it's not perceived as being a pre preventative care measure when it really is that's ultimately what this maintenance is all about for so that you don't actually have to get to the point of, of repair at a stage earlier than need be um but in so in terms of when i'm talking about motivations and like you said cost so when we were first um looking at the motivations before again we intervened with any sort of messaging and education for the participants when we were looking at um you know cost came up quite a lot in in regard to cost and um you know this idea of saving saving the planet very very broadly was a, a intention behind why they would want to repair things um but when we started to educate on the on how you can best maintain and, and repair um really interestingly the the largest motivator ended up being this idea of longevity so making your product obviously last for a lot longer um and the idea of cost and any sort of environmental implications weren't even mentioned at that end of our study um people were focused more on the longevity aspect uh and um on on about avoiding landfill um and mm. reducing the waste um and then another really interesting point that kept coming up as a motivator in place of, of cost is this idea of is it is what I'm doing is there a sufficient ROI like is there benefit for me to be doing this given the input of effort that I'm going to to make it happen so if I have a integrated fridge um you know what's the it, what's it, you know me having to sort of figure out how to get behind the coils of my fridge if you've got a fridge like that um what's the the benefit of me investing that time and energy and effort um to the outcome so that was another motivator that came out that wasn't just related to cost but in saying that cost is ultimately the is the mm -hmm. people say all these other things but when it comes down to it um, cost well, is, sort of cost yeah, versus, in the cost and effort as well because it can sometimes yeah. be you know a pain and like you say you go back and forward and I know somebody uh Georgie's actually on the call she's had an appliance we've recently mended and I think it took two or three visits to sort it out so we, we always have those stories and I think it's it's difficult to sort of have a generic view on it um, and um, thank you to those the, the comments keep coming in go on Andrew I, I was going to say if I could come back on a couple of comments that have been made so Charlie yeah, mentions ahead. about um, harvesting of parts and that's an interesting mm. one it's one we've looked at and it's one that we we do do in certain circumstances so when we get returns back we work with people who refurbish those uh, and then sell them into a, a graded market and they will harvest parts out yeah. of return products but there's a more general um uh, sort of approach the problem with harvesting parts is is that somebody's got to do it you you need an engineer to do it then you need to make an assessment on that part as to how how long it's been used for particularly if it's an older machine how much useful life is it go, is it going to give and and that all comes at a cost um mm -hmm. and i think it's debatable whether or not that cost will be lower than than a new replacement part where you know you know you know what the life of that part has been to date um, and, and the same problem still exists in terms of parts redundancy you, you can put it on the shelf you can harvest it you can put it on the shelf but there's no guarantee anybody's going to buy it um, the other point I wanted to address was Karen's point about multinational company companies lobbying bureaucrats and politicians to maintain control of repair um, unsurprisingly I don't accept that um, certainly not in our industry what we are lobbying for is to say if other people want to do repair, there has to be something in place to make sure that the consumer who owns that product is safe. Um, that's ultimately what it all comes down to, because if there is a safety issue with the product afterwards, nobody's going to look at the person who did the repair. They're going to look at the brand. Um, mm. And, you know, despite what people think, we care about the customer um, and we don't want customers put at risk.
And mm. well, they, again, well, they are your livelihoods, Andrew. So it they are. To, they are. Wouldn't go, it wouldn't go too well. And there does seem to be, and I hear it not just. I mean, Karen's in Australia, I know, but in the UK as well. And um, repair cafes are thriving, and um, we're not we're not seeing the same level of effort, not effort, energy around appliances. Then partly that's because you can't take your appliance down the road to a repair cafe. Yeah. I'm sure. Maybe you could take your angle points lamp. Um, uh, maybe Simon could could uh, give us some uh, anecdotal evidence of that. But I think there is definitely something here. Partly you said about the workhorse products, Andrew. Partly they're big, you know, they're potentially out of our kind of comfort zone. Somebody in the chat said we've lost our ability to repair things. Um, so lots Just, and lots of complicated, you know, what and getting around to sort of what's the what's the solution yeah. here? Can you see a solution, Andrew? Well, I think just on that, just to come back on that mm -hmm. point, um, you know, you're right. The vast majority of products people can't take in a repair cafe. What they can take, as an example, and this is, I do think this is a really valid example, is you, they can take a microwave oven. Um, but right. repair cafes won't touch microwave ovens. And the reason they won't is because they're lethal. Even if they're unplugged, um, they can be lethal. Um, and so, you know, what we're seeing with, you know, some of the the more established repair cafes is they do have policies and, and I think that's where the opportunity exists for us to try and work with them um uh you know I think but we, we've got to find a solution that works for everybody that's yeah. that's what it comes down to yeah absolutely I think given the volume of profit uh, volume of product entering the market you know, we need a maybe a range of solutions, and you've you've explained a couple there um, to allow people at different sort of you know price points or different levels of engagement, as you were saying, Margot, to sort of tap into this. I'm going to shift it slightly, and I will try and come back to um, some more questions here. But I'm just interested in going a little bit earlier up the up the supply chain, if you like, in terms of how products are designed you know are they designed for repairability Andrew you said they were but lots of people might feel that's not the case and other people saying you know uh, what about smaller products whether or not you've got a view um, I know you've worked in tech before but VR headsets has come up here today Apple's iPhones um, and I think I'm going to summarize this to go back to Simon's point he said sorry to say this but it seems that sustainability and repairability in product design still feels tokenistic at best. Uh, what would you say around that, Andrew? Are you seeing this in product design stage? I, I thought you were going to ask Margot that question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that, look, there is, I mean, again, look, I think we are designing for repair on the basis that we repair them. Um, I don't think that any of the regulation is changing the way that we design product. Um, um, but I think what we are doing, I think one of the areas we have to try and strike a balance, and I don't think people always understand this, is this balance between modularity uh, and durability and the fact that we now, in a lot of products, make modules and complete complete parts that will be changed. So it, let me use a consumer electronics example. If you take a, a modern flat panel TV, um, you can't repair that to component level. Effectively, it's probably four parts. It's a front cabinet, a back cabinet, a screen, and one or more printed circuit boards. Um, now, those printed circuit boards aren't repairable, but the truth is, if you didn't design and those manufacture those printed circuit boards in the way that you do, you wouldn't have flat panel TVs because we now have very, very complex printed circuit boards, which are multi-layer and have surface mount components, which require really, really specialist equipment. When I first started, it was in the days of, of, of old fashioned tube TVs where you would change individual components. It's something I used to do. I wasn't very good at it, but it is something I used to do. These days you can't do that. It's you, you change modules. Um, mm -hmm. And so there is this balance between firstly, what do people want? Do people want the new technologies? Um, and secondly, actually, you could argue it in one of two ways. You could argue from the perspective of, well, if you can change individual components, it's cheaper to repair. Or if it's built as modules, it's mm. easier to repair. Mm. And 
you know, in the early days when I repaired TVs, TVs were designed to be modular. Um, and this is a story I quite often tell. So there were lots of different circuit boards. And that was in the days of rental. When the rental engineer came out to repair your TV, he'd identify which board was faulty. He'd take it out. He'd put a new board in. Over time, what we found as an industry that was that because we designed them in that way, it was actually the connections between the boards that were failing because they were being swapped out all the time. So actually, it doesn't always help. Um, and I'm not quite sure where I've got to with that answer now, but but I think hopefully that well, demonstrates design, I think. Some, of, some of the challenges we face is that, yeah. you know, some of the things we do, it's not always obvious why we do them. Um, you know, yeah. as a brand mm -hmm. we're always, or as an industry, we're often uh, criticised over uh, sealed tubs and drums on washing machines, but actually it makes them last longer. I'm happy to debate that with anybody who wants to. Um, so there's a balance. Mm, yeah, good. And that is interesting. And I know there's been a big push towards energy efficiency as well in product design, particularly in your sector, Andrew. Uh, Margot, did you want to come back um, on that product design point? Yeah, so I, um, to, to follow on from what Andrew was saying about, obviously, I think a lot in this in this industry and in a lot of industries, initially it started, a lot of them started with, you know, Dyson's a great example. It started, again, like you were saying with TVs, everything started that it could be pulled apart moved into a stage of you know like you're saying now more multi-level boards etc for the purpose of uh you know change of aesthetics and and people's desires and you know like you said even just that point of the boards connecting so that's that phase and then now we're moving into these sort of smart technologies where you've got we were really fortunate to have a participant in our study who had an incredibly smart smart home whereby he had a dishwasher and a washing machine and a kettle that essentially spoke to him and told him you need to clean me now and and you put in your mm. washing and it would and it would um you know weigh how much detergent would need to be put in and how long it needs to run for so you know it actually takes a lot of the thinking and thinking time and, and effort from the individual and it's now with the um, appliance which in itself can also can be a great thing in many ways for particularly the use and the maintenance factors but then as we've been saying that obviously can create some more difficulty with repair when we're looking at um, obviously within a machine like that it's not necessarily you know take out the little person that speaks to you inside and replace them um, there's you know it's a lot more complex than that so um, that sort of balance between intro introducing these these smart technologies that can be really helpful for us in you know the sort of fast paced world that we're in now we might not have the might not have the required skill sets or, or knowledge to necessarily know how to maintain and repair all the time but then on the flip side that repairability um striking that balance there um and then when we're talking about do people want these new the the sort of next phase of design that is a bit more sort of smart um is mm. people are you know there's a couple of reasons people are Firstly, obviously, at this at this point, a lot of these are quite still, you know, in the higher end of the price price range. Um, and then also, there's sort of perceived small gains from having these new um, technologies in their houses, or you know, like I say, perceived. They they could actually have great impacts, but it's perceived from the mm. from the consumer. Um, and then on the flip side of all of that is that you know, if someone even if they did one of these these sort of new appliances that are would help them. It, does that not go against everything that we're saying with circularity in that does that mean that they have to um, hmm. you know, do something with their existing um, appliances mm -hmm. because if the intention is that they stick around for um, you know 10 15 years on average then uh, is the expectation that we ask them to get these new appliances and what do they do with the old ones so um, I think basically I'm doing a whole lot of back and forth here with um, opportunities and also some of the, the even new barriers that are coming out of the solutions that that are coming out of the industry as well there's always going to be um pros and cons to to these but they're just a couple of the other ideas that have come out from mm, the i think if, if i can add to to that actually before yeah. i add to that I, I did actually want to ask a question from somebody in the chat because many australia have been quite uh, vocal about their repair cafes and and what they do um, i'd be interested to know how they ensure that those carrying out those repairs um are competent and able to do so and what protection they have in place, what insurance they have in place, should it go wrong and somebody is injured? Um, because for us as a brand, they have to be considerations. We, that sounds we have like to... your biggest concern, Andre. It is, safety. yeah, it is. It's mm -hmm. how do we make sure that it's done safely? Um, um, so I, I'd be interested to know how they, they yeah. do that. I think yeah, and Simon on... says about lighting as well, that the, yeah. his lighting association would certainly not be happy, but, they, but he's keen to see an increased level of, um, electrical competence, if you like, and yeah. I know competence in the repair network is something that that you've touched on. Yeah. Um, 
I wonder if we can move on to that. Oh, go on. So did you want? Well, to no, I was, I was going to come back on, on what Margot said, which yeah. is, you know, why are we haven't really touched on is and, and I said before that our appliances are workhorses they're not they're not appliances like phone mm -hmm. uh, phones or or, um, or or games consoles where where people want the biggest better fastest product where we do see a high turnover in our appliances is is really two areas um, one is where people's circumstances change um, so they they need a different product um you know washing machine they have a growing family they need a bigger washing machine and the other um is is where they change their kitchen because and mm. this is this is probably a more western thing but you know people if they're spending you know 10 11 12 000 pounds on a new kitchen don't want an eight or nine year old washing machine in it they want a new one they might want you know we see a lot of of appliances now being sold as statement products particularly big side-by-side -side fridge freezers uh mm. and and range cookers because they have a new kitchen and, and they want there to be a focal point within that kitchen. It tends to be one of those two products. Um, now, a lot of the products coming out of those are perfectly good working products. Uh, and I think an area we, we perhaps need to focus mm -hmm. on is stopping those going into uh, recycling, although they, they can be recovered within recycling and refurbished and put out new, but it's not the best journey, but making sure where they're, there is an opportunity for that appliance to have a second life or third life that we give roots for that to happen. Good. Yeah, I like that. Um, I think it's this roots for that to happen. So I think, you know, when we started, Andrew, you were saying lots is changing. There's definitely a lot more conversation and we can just see the level of interest in this. And let's just move on to reuse then, because I wanted to touch on the sort of social impact. Not, you know, we've focused a little bit on uh, circularity in terms of carbon. And as Margot said, actually, the use phase is a really big deal here. So maintaining that product and using it efficiently, which is why there's been so much uh, emphasis on energy efficiency is where a lot of the carbon impact is right but people don't want to waste products and that's absolutely great and keeping things in use for longer so maybe we could um, touch on um, reuse again this seems like a really obvious no-brainer really um, given the cost of living crisis um, and that sort of thing so um, Margot is that something you've tested in your research reuse appetites for reuse yeah, so we were, I mean, that was um, incorporated, I suppose. It wasn't explicitly a, a something that we were looking at. We were, like I said, mainly looking at maintenance and repair. But in doing so, um, in, in a couple of the people that we were working with had, you know, um, second second life um, products and, and such. Um, the issues that I think that come along with that in the conversations that I had were... Um, obviously sort of not knowing much about the, the what, what they're dealing with, because if it is, uh, it may have uh, bits and bobs from other previous appliances or if they're, or appliances that were refurbished, um, they might not have access to manuals and things that someone has thrown out before they were given to them. So just sort of those practical convenience things that people, uh, when they've got reused products, you know, obviously also a lot of the people are very proud to say that they've got that because there's an association between um, having sort of remanufactured or reused products that um, uh, that means that you're a good person, I suppose, in a very general terms, it's a good thing that you're doing. Um, but then when it comes to the maintenance and repair stage of those items, um, uh, people, I suppose, from the conversations we've had felt even more clueless about how to approach that because they didn't have the, you know, the warranties or the manu manuals yeah. or such. But again, this is just some of the circumstances that uh, we were talking with. It wasn't necessarily a major part of our, our research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, sure. Andrew, what's your view on reuse and where the, where the landscape is moving? Um, I, look, clearly there's a growing market for reuse. And, and I think just to pick up on Margot's point about um, instruction books and, and support and manuals, nearly all manufacturers will have those available on their website and they go back for years. And, and I think that's probably a message that we as manufacturers mm -hmm. need to be better at getting across, which is just because you've bought second hand it doesn't mean we don't want to talk to you we're quite happy to talk to you we're quite happy to give you advice on how to use your product we're quite happy to make um instruction books available on our, our website i think where, where the conversation becomes more complex is is it's a really fragmented fragmented market the the, the second hand mm -hmm. and reuse market um and, and there are there are probably three major concerns one and, and i appreciate i'm sounding a bit like a broken record but safety because safety is my other hat you know most people if not everybody on the call will be aware of what happened um with grenfell tower 
Grenfell Tower involved a refrigerator with a non-flame retardant back, which was common practice 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, are those appliances, modern appliances will have flame retardant backs, they'll stop fires, you know, um, catastrophic fires happening. So is there a point at which we want to take certain products out of the market because safety standards have moved on? Secondly, mm. you know, I think with secondhand products, there is there is a concern around has that product been part of a of a product recall and we've we, we've had plenty of examples where products have been sold secondhand in second hand stores charity stores who to be fair tend to be better but but also retailers who sell secondhand products where well, that product subject to a product recall and it's not been modified um and so what they're effectively selling is a product that, that has a safety risk and then thirdly there's there's the durability um it's how much use has that product had so far mm. um you know if you buy it as a second hand product if it's 10 years old and it's washing machine that's been used four or five times a day every day you know you may not only get a you may only get a month or a couple of months out of it and that's that doesn't really help the consumer and it doesn't represent value for money now none of those are insurmountable problems and and i don't dispute that we as manufacturers have a part to play in that but it's got to be more than just us. Mm, it's good to hear that because a couple of people saying manufacturers need to step up here. Um, and, um, you know, we've got a right to repair a movement. So we do need to, well, in my opinion, bridge some of these, bridge some of these gaps. Really interesting and great points are being made, um, Andrew. And just in the reuse um, in uh, market, I guess, what, what bridges are being made? As an industry, are you working with, um, secondhand uh, outlets, charities, that sort of thing. Can you give us any examples? Yeah, of course. So um, uh, let me give you a couple of examples. One is um, with any of the small domestic appliances that we have back. So kettles, toasters, um, uh, those sorts of products. Um, we do donate all those to a charity in the UK, Salvation Army. Um, they will, we work with them um, to help them. They go through those appliances, anything that is working, um, they will, uh, you know, tidy up and will sell through their shops and the, the money that they raise is goes to support the charity's work. Anything that isn't working will come back to us. Um, and we will ensure that that's responsibly recycled. Um, and we're looking at how we expand, expand that. So we're looking to, to work with them so that, you know, if they've got, for example, let's take a kettle because kettles are really a good example. Three parts effectively in a kettle. There's the lid, there's the kettle, and there's the base. If it's not working, it's only one of those parts that's not working. It's probably the lid is probably fine. Um, and this goes back to the parts harvesting we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. So if we can establish which, which part doesn't work, can we get them to supply, you know, to put the other parts into their stock? And then when people need them, they can they can sell them at a reduced price so that they can keep their kettle going. I don't think, I think we're a long way off the point where where you can start taking some of these products apart because frankly, they just don't have the value in them that enables them to do that and to have a trench and need to do that. There's certainly bits you can do. Microwave oven turntables actually is the other part of it um, where, you know, if a microwave oven is dropped and smashed, you can recover things like turntables, racks, those sorts of things. And again, you can supply those back into mm -hmm. to people who don't want to buy a new one the other area and this this comes through my involvement with through waste electricals is is a lot of the um recycling plants will actually go through everything that comes into them um uh and will determine what can be refurbished and resold now that doesn't matter if it's come from a retailer or a, a civic community site or wherever it all goes through the same process and i think and one of the things we're doing with them now is seeing how we work with them firstly so we can gather information on the age of our appliances going through so we can do some durability analysis but also how we can work with them so that you know firstly they can age a product so they know if it's 10 years old they shouldn't be refurbishing it they should mm -hmm. be recycling but secondly um trying to to help them actually refurbish more efficiently because you know there is limited value in a refurbished appliance so 
the money you can invest in refurbishing it is limited. So how can we help them do, do that more efficiently so that more product gets back out into the market? That's really interesting. I think we've started with cost and we're coming back around to cost. And I'm still reading all these brilliant comments and questions. You know, um, some people saying, you know, most frustrating things are plastic bits that break. You know, newer appliances have not been designed to make, not necessarily repairable, but for longevity. Go back to your point, Margot. So there's a real mix here, isn't there? And I'm wondering whether the right to repair legislation will uh, push us over some sort of tipping point Andrew or whether actually we're being hit from the side here with climate change targets and actually we should focus all our efforts on on reducing that use phase um so I'm going to just throw a sort of last couple of questions at you Margot uh, could you give us a couple of examples or one example of a product where the use phase is um is 50 percent of the environmental carbon footprint I, I think I know of a couple what what would you say, Margot, the biggest products with the biggest use phase are? Um, so washing machines. So that example that I gave at the very beginning was about washing machines and they're between 73 and 93 percent of their environmental uh, carbon in, carbon uh, um, footprint, sorry, specifically um, is within the use phase. So that's if that's is that's the, the answer. Off there. <laughs> so that's one of them. Um, so but it's across the board, it's very much in that in, in the use phase, because that is obviously when you're when we're talking about energy intensity, um, that's when you're using something over a course of, of 10, 15 years. Obviously, this is also keeping in mind we're talking, this is if we're talking about appliances that are in use for the, you know, um, the recommended period of use. Average amount of time. Yeah, average, average use of, of time that they, they could be around that use phase. If the use phase is, you know, you use it for one year, then you throw it out because you want a different color. Obviously that that percentage wouldn't be the same as no. having that. So, um, so yeah. And that's something I, that I've heard talked about before. And Andrew, just going back to your point about almost like a passport for a document. And Georgie's put something in here about how do we track, uh, what tracking functionality is being developed. Seems to me there's a lot of moving parts in this puzzle mm -hmm. and part of the gap is in not just knowledge, but skills, but also knowledge about, excuse the pun, all these moving parts. Um, just, to, just to wrap up, Andrew, have you got any thoughts on that? How do we track items a bit better and give consumers more of a passport to their product? Yeah, electronic passports is something that's being looked at um, at a European level. Um, uh, and I'm sure that will come in time. Quite a lot of information it will contain, I'm not sure, but um, you know, it's still still being discussed. But there will certainly be something that will allow us to track it. At the same time, we are also looking at technologies that will allow us to interrogate appliances when an engineer goes out, so um, or when we get one in for repair, so that you can you can look at which programs have been used, how often it's been used, um, and that will help us determine. Um, you know, when when we get a product, particularly if it's come off the market from the original customer and has gone through some sort of returns process, you can look at, you know, is it worth refurbishing or not? You know, if it's been used for, for eight years and the motor's been hammered, then it's not. If it's been used for four years and it's barely been touched, then then it is. And they're things we don't know when an appliance comes back to us. So we end up making judgments based on, um, you know, just looking at it awesome. and seeing how clean and tidy it is. I think to, to come back on, on one of Margot's points, and again, I think she, she makes a really relevant point. Um, we know from our own research that most customers, when they buy washing machines over the lifetime of that product, will probably use two programs. We could make a washing machine that only has two programs on it, but they wouldn't buy it. They want and and really my point is there is a difference between what a customer wants when they buy it and how they use it as another example you know all our fridges have a thermostat control in them um to adjust the temperature of the fridge most customers when they buy the fridge will set it to three in the middle uh and will never touch it again over the lifetime of that product there is a consumer education piece mm. in that um which we need Certainly, again, manufacturers have a part to play in that, but we're not going to get the message across ourselves. And perhaps one of the biggest messages, and I'll stop at that point, is people think that if they put a washing machine in eco mode because it's a longer cycle, it's costing them more money and it's using more energy. And it's not. It's the difference between uh, having a Ferrari and driving between London and Newcastle really quickly uh, and having a push bike and cycling 
there really slowly. It will take you longer, but actually the energy and the climate impact is lower. Mm -hmm. Good, okay. And Margot, would you, I, I'm conscious of the time, we said we'd go over a few minutes because we've got such good questions, but um, would you be able to sum up your thoughts uh, around sort of almost, you know, what, what the key, key priorities, key takeaways for you are? Yeah, so I think uh, just going straight on from what Andrew was just saying then around energy efficiency. So in the report that we've put together, which we can share following the webinar if anyone's yeah, interested. Do. Mm -hmm. um, so the like I've been we've speak, been speaking about maintenance and repair a lot in this call, but um, the other major aspect we were looking at was energy efficiency. So exactly to that point of people not understanding their settings or you know not 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 caring really, just choosing something and, and sticking with it, um, and then uh, you know other sort of various you know, I, I, perceptions of best ways to uh, be energy efficient. So there's a lot more in that report. Mm. If that's to look further into but in terms of sort of the I guess the summary of coming some of the the recommendations that we that have come out of the work that we were looking at was definitely this piece on education and that was sort of the whole instigation of this of of the research and why we were um what we what we were going into it was asking the question of what role can education play and um overwhelmingly with what we what came out of us having our interventions of of the messaging of, of um how to best uh uh, be more energy efficient with their appliances, maintain them in a better way, and, and ultimately in in um, best uh, repair behaviors as well. Um, overwhelmingly, the response was that education is is ultimately helpful. And we were, for example, we had fifty new um, behaviors that were sort of communicated through our uh, messaging, and of those. Uh, of the 50, 22 of those were new behaviours that were applied by the households um, just as a result of our one month of messaging that was wow. through to them. Um, wow. We also plan to do a follow-up in a couple of months to sort of see how long-term that, that, that messaging sits with them. Um, and ultimately, if it's at this idea that there's a need to be at a, a, a closer temporal um, point for, mm, for the, the right think, time in, in the context of, of now you know post COVID a lot of people working from home um, cost of living crisis there's so many sort of macro level contextual factors that are sort of just dominating our lives that the decision to fill your kettle all the way up or halfway is really bottom of the list but can really have a large impact on on your mm. um, not only your energy efficiency but then um, how you're maintaining your products as well so yeah. um, so a couple it of sounds to me like we I, and I, I'm not one for creating new bodies, but it sounds I know both of you have been in, are engaged with Amdia, the, the, the industry body for appliances. But it sounds to me like we are in a new era where we do need to, um, you know, educate people at all levels. And there's a role in that, be it moral or be it cost or, you know, uh, any any reason for manufacturers. There's also a desire there very much um, from the consumers. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody. I think we could be here another hour easily. Um, do jump onto LinkedIn, carry on conversations with people. Um, I think Simon's last point there, right at the wire was, how do we increase the value of repair? Um, we focused on repair, but today was all about circularity. I think if we can get repair right, we sort of solve a few of the other issues around reuse as well. And I know there's a lot already happening around recycling. So, so apologies to any of those who wanted to talk about recycling, but we definitely did a deep dive into repair. Um, uh, Margot, a couple of people have asked if you can uh, share the details of your research, please. Uh, that would be great. And uh, or, or maybe share your, your, your LinkedIn and people can get in touch with you. Um, I'm just going to wrap up there, Akansha. Thanks so much. Uh, over to you. Thank you, Emma, and I would request the panel to share their LinkedIn profiles uh, over the chat section so that everybody, whoever has not been able to resolve their queries due to the constraint of time. And I think, Emma, we should have another session of this because this is one hell of a session. We'll do another one on the other end, the recycling. Exactly. Really I think we, will, we should have a, you know, a second edition to it. So request everybody, all the panelists, to please share your uh, email IDs and your uh, LinkedIn profiles so that the attendees can uh, further have this uh, discussion of the forum. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining in and taking time out, and especially uh, Andrew, uh, Margot, and Emma for uh, you know sharing your insights. And I'm, I'm sure this one hour was not enough. So let's have 
a discussion where we can have more of such discussions on these. And this is the platform where we are initiating such waste dialogues and such issues on circularity on sector basis. So uh, we request everybody to please, please attend these uh, sessions uh, in future as well and to connect to our uh, you know, website and our LinkedIn and on our social media channels. We have been uh, communicating whatever uh, we have been uh, doing for every month. Uh, this, as I mentioned, this webinar is going to be recorded and will be available on the WasteWise uh, website and YouTube. So uh, good evening to everybody and have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks you. Margo. Thanks Andrew.